Now we're going to talk about electronegativity and polarity, and these are really important concepts for understanding how chemicals interact with each other. Bless you. You probably have noticed that oil and water don't mix. If you put, you know, if you have vegetable oil and water in a cup like, like this one, you can mix them all you want, but as soon as you stop, they settle out into two layers. Same thing happens with Italian salad dressing. You can shake it up and shake it up and shake it up, and as soon as you stop shaking, all the oil goes to the top and the vinegar and the water stay at the bottom. Why is that? Well, it does, density does play into it. Density is the reason why the water's on the bottom and the oil's on the top, but why do they separate? Other things of dis different densities will mix together. So it has, it has to do with the properties of the water molecules and the properties of the oil and how they interact with each other. Let's look at the uh, Lewis structure for water molecule. So we learned how to draw these. Here we've got the oxygen in the center. It has an octet of electrons because it has these two lone pairs and it has uh, two bonds with hydrogen. And so the hydrogen has, an, the, I'm sorry, the oxygen has an octet, the hydrogens each have a duet, and so we said that they were happy. Well, the hydrogen and the oxygen are sharing a pair of electrons, but they're not sharing equally. Okay, this is like, you know, when one of my middle boys shares a cookie with the little one. He breaks it in half, but it's not really half, right? And he gives the little part to his little brother. Yes, he's sharing his cookie, but it's not at all equal because he knows he can get away with it. So when hydrogen and oxygen share a pair of electrons, they don't share equally, and oxygen hogs the electrons. And so this, this is not an equal sharing. Electronegativity is a... Um, a property of elements that describes um, how they share electrons. It's really defined as the ability of an element to attract electrons within a covalent bond. So looking at covalent bonds, electronegativity, if the electronegativity is higher, it means that element is going to hog the electrons more than the less electronegative element. You can think of it a little bit like playing tug-of-war. You know, if you have two people of equal strength pulling on opposite ends of a rope, it's, it's equal, and the rope doesn't go anywhere. But if one person is stronger, they're pulling on the rope harder than the other person, and then the rope's going to move. Or you could think of people, you know, a husband and wife sleeping, and you have always, there's always one blanket hog, right? Somebody's hogging the blankets. Okay, so in these bonds, I'm making this up. Can you tell? Um, in, the, in these bonds, one of the atoms is hogging the electrons. They're not sharing equally. Oxygen is more electronegative. It has more attraction for those electrons. And those, so they, they're going to spend more time near the oxygen atom than near the hydrogen atom. Electronegativity is just um, a relative scale um, they just, there's no absolute measurement of electronegativity. You can only just compare two elements. And so they just kind of randomly said, well, here's zero and here's four. So they said the most electronegative element, which is fluorine, has an electronegativity of 4.0. Kind of like a grading scale, I guess. And it goes down from there. So fluorine's the most electronegative. <coughs> Um, here's a table that shows us these electronegativities. And we can see there's a periodic trend going on here. So over here, um, cesium has an electronegativity of 0.7, which is very weak. That's the lowest one. And as we go across a period, electronegativity, electronegativity tends to increase. And if we come down a group it tends to decrease. So fluorine's over here at the top. Fluorine is the most electronegative. And hydrogen, of course, has got to be an exception to everything. And so 
he doesn't really follow that trend. And why are these guys over here not even included? They have a full electron shell? They have a full electron shell. They really don't form bonds. Electronegativity has to do with covalent bonds. Those uh, noble gases form almost no compounds, and so we just kind of ignore them when we talk about electronegativity. So you can do things where you look at the actual values of the electronegativity and compare them, and that's helpful. But for an exam, what I want is for you to be able to um, just compare them relatively without looking at the numbers especially. So this is an illustration of a hydrogen-oxygen covalent bond, looking at the electron density of how that pair of electrons is shared. So we see that there's, you know, more density around the oxygen than there is around the hydrogen. And the cloud here is kind of... Uh, bulging over here by the oxygen and it's less by the hydrogen. The electrons that are being shared are going to spend more time over here than they are over there. And because of that, this end of the bond develops a partial negative charge. And this end of the bond develops a partial positive charge. And we use this Greek delta, that's the lowercase delta, the uppercase delta looks like a triangle. Delta plus means a partial positive, and delta minus means a partial negative. So this is not an ionic situation where oxygen takes the electron from hydrogen. They're still sharing, but it's not very equal. So the electrons spend more time over here, and so that results in a little bit of a negative charge. And so we call this a dipole moment. It's a separation of charge within this bond. Okay, so I have an analogy for, for this. The electrons are little boys, okay? And one, one little boy, um, this is his house over here, mm -hmm. oxygen, and the other little boy lives at the hydrogen house, and they like to play together. So they're a pair of little boys, and they go back and forth between these two houses. Over here, um, these guys are not very well off. They leave, lead a pretty simple life. They have, um, they have an old VHS tape player and, and some old VHS tapes. They don't even have Netflix. They don't have cable. Uh, they don't even have an HD TV, so they can't even get network TVs over the in, you know, channels over the Internet. They don't have a computer, and if you're hungry, mom will make you bread with butter and give you a glass of water. They don't even have an ice maker, so, you know, it's just lukewarm water from, straight from the tap. Over here, oxygen, this is a fun place. They've got a pool in the backyard, they've got a trampoline, they've got big screen TV, they've got satellite TV with all the channels, and none of them are blocked, and they've got all the gaming systems, and if you're hungry, mom will order you a pizza. And they actually have a soda fountain in their kitchen. Where are those two little boys going to spend more time? They're going to go to Oxygen's house almost all the time. But this little guy who lives at, at the Hydrogen house, he still loves his parents. So it's not like he's going to move over here and stay here permanently and abandon his family. Okay? That would be an ionic bond. Where, where he leaves this family and becomes permanently attached, perhaps they even adopt him over here, okay? That would be an ionic bond. This is still a covalent bond. There's sharing, and he's going to go back home and get a change of clothes and give his mom a kiss occasionally and say, hey, love you, mom. Don't like the house, but I love you. you know, and then they go back to Oxygen's house and play. So the two little boys go back and forth between the house, but it's not very equal. They spend more time over at oxygens because it's more attractive to them. The, ox the electrons spend more time at oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative. It is more attractive to the electrons. Any questions? Anybody want direction to ox directions to oxygen's house? <laughs> uh -huh. So when we have 
Covalent bonds with a dipole moment, we call these polar covalent bonds. You think about what polar, just in your everyday life, what does polar, <coughs> what kind of connotation, what do you think of when you think of polar? Like extremes. Like extremes, like the North Pole and the South Pole, right? Polar opposites. Opposites, a separation, okay? So a polar covalent bond is one that has one end that's different than the other. One end is a little bit negative, one end is a little bit positive. The greater the electronegativity difference between the two atoms, the greater the separation of charge. So if, if those two houses have equal amenities, you know, if they both have the same kind of TV and the mom is equally nice and the same snacks and the same everything, the boys are probably going to go back and forth pretty equally. If you have two atoms with the same electronegativity, they're going to share the electrons equally. But the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar that covalent bond gets, the bigger the dipole moment. So here's an illustration of identical electronegativities. Um, so if you have two atoms of the same element, then obviously the difference in electronegativity is going to be zero. But there's, there's a range, okay? And so there's not a hard line that here this is where it stops being equal and here's where it's really polar and actually the very extreme would be an ionic bond. It's a continuum and so we've kind of arbitrarily said, okay, this region will call this and this region will call that. So we say if the difference is between 0 and 0.4, we'll say that that's a nonpolar covalent bond. There the electrons are shared equally. So if there's a teeny tiny difference, um, we just say, well, it's not, worth, it's not worth considering. The difference isn't enough to be important. So anytime you have two atoms of the same element, I want you to be able to recognize that that's a pure covalent bond. It's a non-polar covalent bond, and they are shared equally because the two places are identical. The two atoms are identical. If you have a, a really, really large electronegativity difference, like between sodium and chlorine, the difference is 2.0 or greater, then it's actually an ionic bond. And that's where, you know, the one kid's house is just so inferior that he leaves those people and he goes and becomes adopted and permanently stays at the other house. That's an ionic bond where the electron is transferred. It's not shared at all. It's like, no, I'm going to give it to you. You take it. The other one says, okay, now it's mine. And if I'm going to leave town, I'm going to take that electron with me. I'm not going to give it back. It's an ionic bond. It's an extreme version so there's a continuum from zero electronegativity difference where the electrons are shared completely equally up to an extreme difference where one takes the electron and the other one completely gives it up. And then somewhere in between are the polar covalent bonds. So ionic bonds, um, ionic bonds you recognize as being between a metal and a nonmetal. And we've learned that um, in other places. So metal, nonmetal, ionic bond. The intermediate difference is the polar covalent bond. So that's if the difference is between 0.4 and 2.0. So there may be questions in mastering chemistry. haven't quite finished assigning those yet. There may be um, questions in there where you actually have to look at that chart and compare the electronegativity difference and, and based on that decide, okay, this is polar or nonpolar or ionic but I won't, I won't do that on an exam, and you don't have to memorize that chart, okay? So hydrogen and fluorine are an example of a polar covalent bond. I don't remember what's next on this slide. Okay, that's a good slide. So there's a continuum here. From zero difference or very small difference, and then we've got kind of an intermediate difference where we call those polar covalent bonds up to a more extreme difference and there we have the ionic bonds. And those are just kind of arbitrary guidelines 
and you don't need to remember these numbers either okay because what I'm going to let's see if let's, I'm going to write out my my little own my own little guidelines my little own it was a very short night last night okay so what do I expect you to remember two atoms of the same element. That's one situation. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. Because if they're the same, their electronegativities mm -hmm. have to be the same, right? The other extreme is metal. I guess I don't need the number one there. Valent, metal, and nonmetal. That's an ionic bond. That's the extreme version. In between is two different nonmetals. There are some exceptions, but this guideline usually works. If it's two different nonmetals, generally it's going to be polar covalent. I expect you to know that. If you look at, at a bond and it's two identical atoms, like it's a chlorine chlorine bond or it's a, a selenium selenium bond a bond between two identical atoms, you should understand that that's a nonpolar bond. There's no dipole moment. The electrons are shared equally. If you see a compound in which you have a metal and a nonmetal, you should recognize that as an ionic compound where the electrons were completely transferred. They're not even shared at all. If you have two different nonmetals, say bromine and carbon, any two nonmetals, in the absence of other information, assume that that's a polar covalent bond. That there's sharing, but unequally. Any questions about that? So you may need to use this table. Where'd it go? You may need to use a table like this in doing the homework. And, the, and that's helpful but I won't make you do anything like that on the exam. And, and when you're using that table, you're going to have to look at a table like this. Now just for example, if we look at, um, oops, I can't do that, nitrogen. Nitrogen has an electronegativity of 3.0 and Bromine has an electronegativity of, what is that, 2.8. So 3.0 and 2.8, the difference there is 0.2. So according to the chart, that's a nonpolar covalent bond. So if you have the information, then you look it up. On, the, <clears throat> on an exam situation, I'll ask you things that are more clear cut. Because there are a few that have exactly the same um, carbon and sulfur are the same. Um, boron and arsenic. But usually we're going to see things like nitrogen and oxygen where the difference is 0.5. That's more than 0.4. It's a polar bond. Okay. Yes, question. Is there a, an electric electronegativity up here at the table in our book? Or you could just Google this it. slide is in your book. Okay. All these figures that are in the slides are from your textbook. Okay. So yeah, it's in there. And all the tables, all those things. Any other questions? So I think there's an example here. So which of the following contains a nonpolar, purely covalent bond? So this would be a good exam question. Which one of these has a completely nonpolar bond? I2. I2. Okay. Uh, let me just circle. 
We can pick that one out because that is a bond between two iodine atoms. Mm -hmm. Those are exactly the same. So it has to be nonpolar. The rest of these, um, a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, <coughs> in the absence of other information, I would, I would expect you to say that's polar covalent because it's two nonmetals. Which they share, but not evenly. They share, but not evenly. Okay. Calcium and chlorine, ionic. ionic, because calcium is a metal and chloride, chlorine is a nonmetal. So that's going to form ionic. Calcium is going to give ions to chlorine, and we looked at how that happens. Carbon oxygen bond. Carbon and oxygen are two nonmetals, they're not the same. Unless you were given a table of electronegativities, which I'm not going to give you, it's a waste of paper, then I would expect you to predict that that's a polar bond. Okay? Polar covalent? Polar covalent. Okay. You can only, polar ionic is, is kind of redundant. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that's like extreme polar. So you can say polar or, co or covalent? So we'd say covalent. Um, your book mm -hmm. sometimes says purely covalent or nonpolar. I prefer polar and nonpolar to describe covalent. Okay. But we kind of have to go with what's in the textbook, too. And then ionic is completely a different thing. Mm -hmm. Does this make any sense? Mm -hmm. So when we were graphing in the lab, those electronegativities, this is what you were graphing. And there were some, some tendencies, some trends that we saw as, as you graphed it by atomic number. Which one of these contains one or more polar covalent bonds but is nonpolar? Uh, we haven't talked about that yet. Let's, I'm hoping there's more slides here. Yeah, okay, we're, we'll have to come back to that one. That one's misplaced. So there are polar bonds and there are polar molecules. And just because a molecule has polar bonds does not automatically mean that it is a polar molecule. So a polar molecule means that the entire molecule has a dipole moment, that one end of the molecule is slightly positive and one end is slightly negative. And this happens when those, those polar bonds, the dipole moments of the individual bonds, add up instead of canceling out. If you have a diatomic molecule, diatomic means two atoms, you only have two atoms, you only have one bond between them. If that has a polar bond, then the molecule's polar. But if you have more than two atoms, then you have to think about the shape of the molecule. So that's why we had to learn Vesper theory, so we can predict the shapes of the molecules. Now we learned how to predict whether the polar bonds, polar or nonpolar bonds. Now we can stick the two together. So let's look at carbon dioxide. Uh, this kind of squished. This needs to be edited, but oh well. Here is the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. This carbon has a double bond with the oxygen and a double bond with the other oxygen. They all have eight electrons. They all have octets in this, and so they're all happy. Carbon and oxygen, would you predict that that's a polar bond or nonpolar? It's a covalent bond, but is it polar or nonpolar? It's polar because carbon and oxygen are different, right? And so un unless we go look at the table, which even if we did look at the table, that this is polar. So the bond difference, the, the, the electronegativity difference between oxygen and carbon is 1, which is definitely greater than mm -hmm. 0. 0.4. One way to indicate... Um, one way to indicate the direction of these um, dipole moments is with these arrows. So oxygen, if we look at the periodic table, the, the easiest way to remember the trend is that fluorine is the most electronegative. So if you're closer to fluorine, you're more electronegative. So if we look at carbon and oxygen on the periodic table, oxygen is closer to fluorine. Oxygen is more electronegative. And so then we can draw an arrow from the oxygen, I'm sorry, from the carbon 
in the direction of the oxygen, saying that's the direction of that dipole moment. This end is positive, so we put a little plus there on the arrow, and this is pointing to the negative end. So this arrow points to the more electronegative atom. It's like a little arrow saying, the boys are over there. It's like the neighbor standing in the yard. Hey, where's my kid? They're over there. They're pointing at the more attractive place. That's where they're going to be almost all the time. So the arrow's pointing there. That's the one bond. The other bond is also between carbon and oxygen. And so its dipole moment points in the other direction. Okay? So to figure out if this molecule is polar or not, we have to think about its geometry. We learned on Tuesday that we look at we look at this carb, the central atom, and we say, well, how many groups of electrons are there? There's two. There's two double bonds. There's no lone pairs or anything. How do two things get away from each other? They go to opposite sides. So this is a linear molecule. And so this picture is correct. It's a linear molecule. They're in a line. And so we have these opposing forces. We have one pulling this way and one pulling that way. They're between the same two types of atoms. Carbon-oxygen has the same electronegativity difference as carbon and oxygen, right? So they're equal and opposite. They cancel each other out. It's a little bit like playing tug-of-war. So you've got a guy in the middle, little guy in the middle, and you've got these big guys. So you've got the tight end in the middle, and you've got the O-line guys on, on each side pulling. And they're stronger than he is. So if it was just oxygen and carbon and they were playing tug-of-war, the rope would move towards the oxygen because he's stronger. He's more attractive to those electrons. But here you've got the carbon. He's a little guy. You've got oxygen pulling on that side, and you have oxygen pulling on this side. Those forces cancel each other out. And his arms are going to get longer, but he's not going to move, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Another way to think of this you know, if you're more mathematically minded, is we're adding vectors. Okay, so the vector length is the same because the electronegativity difference is equal. So the vector length is the same, and the vectors are pointing in opposite directions, and so they cancel out and they add up to zero. So this molecule, even though it has polar bonds, the molecule is nonpolar. Yes? Um, when we do this kind of analysis, uh, do we do it two-dimensionally, or like, do we do bent as well? Cause we, we have to think in three dimensions for the three-dimensional molecules. It's easier to think about the two-dimensional ones. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we start with them. And this, this is really one-dimensional. It's a line, and so that's the easiest mm -hmm. thing to think about. So we always start with carbon dioxide. Any questions about this one? Because it's not going to get any easier. It's going to get a little, little more complicated. So if you don't understand this one, let's figure it out now. I'm, I'm just, I don't know, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. It can be a polar molecule, but the bonds are not. Yeah. Well, backwards, actually. Because okay. you said polar molecule and the bonds are nonpolar. Nonpolar molecule, <coughs> but the bonds are polar. Right. It's like taking a positive number and a negative number and adding them together. If you take plus 5 and minus 5 and add them together, you get 0, right? If you took plus 2 and minus 5, they would add up to minus 3. There would be a direction. So you could think of this as being like a number line where this is 0 and this is plus something and this is minus something. And, and one of them is pulling us, you know, this many s that way, and the other one is trying to get us to go this many this way, and they end up adding to zero. Just like if you add two equal but opposite numbers. Does that help at all? They're just pulling in opposite directions. So one oxygen is trying to pull the electrons off to his side. The other oxygen is trying to pull the electrons off to his side. What we end up with is a molecule that does not have a positive and a negative end. Both ends are going to be the same. Okay?
So on a, mole, on a molecule, if it's polar, then one end of the molecule has to be slightly positive and one end has to be slightly negative. But here, I guess you could say that the ends are slightly positive, the uh, negative, the middle is slightly positive, but that doesn't make the ends different from each other. And so, uh, I don't want to go any further. The bonds are so the bonds are polar, but the molecule's nonpolar. It's nonpolar because, because they're canceling out. They cancel each other out. Molecule. It's a nonpolar molecule with polar bonds. Because each one is pulling to the opposite yeah. sides. Yeah, and for for understanding the polarity of molecules, I think the, the tug of war analogy, the, the little boy analogy doesn't work real well for this, but the tug of war. So you know, I'm carbon, and I've got oxygen pulling on this side and oxygen pulling on that side. They're pulling equally. I'm not going to move. If this guy on my left is pulling stronger than that one, then overall we're all going to move this direction. Does that make sense? Think about pulling on something. Polar means um, a separation, a difference. And so one end is different than the other. They're not equal. So one atom is pulling the electrons to it, and the other atom is, you know, they're both, they both want those electrons. When you said it, it clicked. Good, it now. Good. Okay. good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else need Wyndham to say something and have it make sense? <laughs> you want to finish teaching this? Sure. Yeah, that would be good. Because I'm feeling a little tired. So... <laughs> we could just all go home and you could learn it out of the book, right? And then that would be great and I wouldn't have to come. Yeah, that wouldn't work, would it? There's a reason that we have class. Okay, so one way to think about this is vector notation. We can represent bonds as arrows, vectors, that point in the direction of the negative pole. So they're, it's like the neighbor pointing, the kids went over there. They went to the cool house. Okay, so the arrow points to the more electronegative atom, plus sign at the positive pole. But these, these arrows have direction, and the direction is important. If the arrows are pointing in exactly opposite directions, like in carbon dioxide, then the vectors cancel out. They're opposing forces, and so there's no net force. Let's see what's next. Okay, so let's look at water. Water is a bent molecule. If we look at its uh, electron, uh, its Lewis structure, ooh, that's too big. If we look at the Lewis structure, it has two pairs of lone pairs. So when we think for Vesper theory, we look at the oxygen, we count there are four groups. Four groups get away from each other, making that weird tetrahedral shape. So this, we have to think in three dimensions, because if we didn't consider those lone pairs, we'd say, well, here's the oxygen. There's a hydrogen on one side, hydrogen on the other side. That'd be linear, right? But the lone pairs are in there. They're invisible. They're like ninja, okay? They're invisible, but they're important, and they're repulsive, okay? And so they're going to push those atoms closer together than if they weren't there. So water has a bent structure. And so then when we look at the dipole in the bonds, oxygen is to the right of hydrogen in the periodic table. Oxygen is more electronegative. And so this arrow points toward oxygen. Oxygen's hogging the electrons. And over here, oxygen's hogging the electrons. So here, oxygen's hogging the electrons. Now, if this was a linear molecule, those forces would oppose each other and they would cancel out and there would be no net difference. Because, because these forces are, in the, the previous example, they were pulling out. And that makes a little more sense to us. But if they're pushing in, they're still opposing each other and they're canceling each other out. But in water, they're not opposing directly opposite. They're at an angle. 
So now I'm playing tug of war with two people who are kind of standing out in front of me. So I'm oxygen, okay? I'm oxygen, and I'm playing tug of war with Emily and Andrew. Well, heaven forbid, a clone of Andrew, because these guys are identical. A clone of Andrew. <gasps> yeah, so two four-year-olds. And they're kind of out in front of me. And we're playing tug of war, but I'm stronger than they are. Okay, so I am pulling, and they're both pulling against me, but it's not opposite. And so when I'm pulling on them, I'm going to move backwards, and they're going to be dragged with me. And this whole business is going to move in that direction. Vector addition. Yeah. It's vector addition. So some of you understand vector addition, so you're good. I say vector addition, you're like, oh, okay. And others of you are like, huh? What's vector addition? It's that part of math class that you repressed. <laughs> Maybe you could go to psychological counseling and they could help you. Uh, but that might bring up all kinds of other things, so we don't want to do that. No. Um, I don't remember what the next slide is. Let's just talk a minute about vector addition. Because, well, it may help. So we'll just go with, with possibility, bless you. So if we're, if we're adding two things of equal length that are opposite to each other, either pointing to each other or pointing away from each other, that's a net of zero because they're equal and opposite, okay? They're equal and opposite, they oppose each other. If you have things though going at an angle, you can think of those as having other components. So that, that yellow arrow has a component going this way and it has a component going that way. And the other arrow has the same components. So if you're getting from, I need a different color, if we call this point A and this point, not that point, this point B. If you're getting from point A to point B, you can go in a straight line. There, there are streets in, in a lot of these valley towns where in the center of town everything's on an angle, right? Do you ever know, you know why that is? Yeah. Lines up with the railroad tracks. Lines up with the railroad tracks. It's very weird. So most of these little towns, they have the center of town. There's a, a square that's set on the diagonal. And so in Reedley, you can go from point A to point B by going on this angled street. Or you can go this way and that way. Do you get to the same place? You do. Do you travel farther? Yeah, but you get to the same place. So that's a little bit what vector addition is like. So we can take that angled arrow, that angled vector, and pull it into its component parts, which is one going this way, the blue one, and one going that way, and add those individually. The red ones are equal and opposite. The red ones add up to zero. So the red ones give us zero. There's no no difference, okay? There's, they're equal and opposing. But the blue ones are going to add up. The blue ones are going to add up to go twice as far in that direction. So when we take those two vectors and add them, we end up with this. In this class, do we only think of vector addition like qualitatively, or do we do quantitative? Like, We're only going to think of it in, in terms of qualitative. Okay. We're not going to be comparing that, well, we have two polar bonds, and these are their angles, but one is stronger than the other. We're not going to go there. Thank goodness, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. We're just looking at um, polar bonds that are equal in strength to each other, but looking at the angles at which they're pointing. So if we have, here's different cases that we can have. So we can have a situation like this 
which is like the carbon monoxide, I'm sorry, carbon dioxide, where you have two identical polar bonds and they're pointing in opposite directions. They could be pointing out or they could be pointing in. Either way, that's going to be a nonpolar bond, a nonpolar molecule, I'm sorry. If, and that's a linear molecule. If you have a trigonal planar molecule and you have three identical polar bonds, they're going to be either pulling away from each other or pushing into each other. And again, there's no net difference. And so this is also a nonpolar molecule. If we have a trigonal pyramid or a bent molecule and we have polar bonds, then we're going to have some net movement. When we add these two vectors, we end up with a little vector that goes in this direction. And so this is a polar molecule. This guy's going to be polar as well because all these vectors are pulling in one direction. And so the whole thing, if you're thinking tug of war, the whole thing's going to move. Then over here, here we've got a tetrahedral arrangement. If all of those vectors are the same, if all the dipole moments are the same, it's going to be nonpolar. So there are many situations where you can have polar bonds but have the molecule be nonpolar. Any questions? No, we don't want to go to that so yet. So is the tetrahedral is only nonpolar if the four elements are all the same, right? Yes. The four elements on the outside of this. Right. So I I you know, like I said, I forgot to review these slides, so I don't know what's coming next. But so I'm just gonna wing it here and <laughs> tell you the stuff that I usually tell people. That was horrible, right? I, gra I graded your lab instead. Can I tell you you have a life and children and things to do besides that person? Yeah, and I stayed up till 12.30 washing dishes. And emailing students. I'm hearing excuses. I'm full of excuses. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, so that's all very nice. Um, I, I generally find that students, you know, I say vector and their eyes glaze over, right? And they're like, what, huh? Okay, so I've got some simple rules of thumb that, that work. Let's see if I can write with any semblance of, of neatness. So this, these are Mrs. K's rules. Molecule is nonpolar. Ran out of space. If both of these are true. So two conditions they have to both be true. Okay, the first thing is no lone pairs on the central atom. See, one of these days I'm going to get it together and make this into a real slide so I don't have to do this. <laughs> If one of these days ever comes, I'm going to be so busy. I have so many great ideas, and I just I never any time. So, no lone pairs. And all the atoms bonded to the central atom. All atoms bonded to central atom. That's a T. Have to be either identical or have identical um, <coughs> electronegativities. All atoms bonded to central atom. That's the end. Have the same electronegativity. Electronegativity. Do some elements share the same electronegativity? Yeah. Okay. So we get to then, like, hypothetically saying, I'm not, I don't know, the, let's just hypothetically say we had a, a carbon. Just mm -hmm. say that the other two have um, the oxygen and or the carbon and the bromine have the exact same electronegative right. charge. They will. They yeah, will if if them. you happen to have two atoms, I can't remember off the top of my head. I mean, we mentioned a couple earlier. I think like carbon and bromine might have exactly the same electronegativity. Okay. If you, you can have a nonpolar molecule under these rules where not all the atoms are the same element, but they have to have the same electronegativity. Okay. 
but I'm not going to trick you with that on an exam. Okay, so if you look at it and the atoms bonded to the central atom are all the same element, then obviously they have the same electronegativity. Okay, question? Um, I understand that, but what happens if you had four, uh, or two different elements, let's say easy, and the, there is a difference, but the difference is less than 0.4? Would I, would, I would still expect you to say that that's a polar molecule. Okay. There are degrees of polarity, and we're not going to get hung up on little details like that. But let's do a couple of examples here. Um, I know green is a good color. This may be too dark. Light green. Um, so let's look at carbon dioxide because we already looked at that. So you you have to be able to look at the Lewis structure for the molecule. So here's the Lewis structure for carbon monoxide. So you look at the Lewis structure and you ask yourself, are there any lone pairs on the central atom? No, no lone pairs. Are the atoms bonded to the central atom the same? Yes, they are. They're both oxygen. Therefore, this is nonpolar. Is that easier than the vector thing? <laughs> no? <laughs> Well, if you understand vectors, that's fine. That's great. Let's look at water. Lewis structure for water. Are there lone pairs on the central atom? No. Yes. We're done. This is polar. It doesn't matter that the hydrogens are the same. The lone pairs make this an unsymmetrical molecule because they push those hydrogens over so it can't be linear, it can't be symmetrical. The lone pairs cause asymmetry in the molecule and asymmetry with polar bonds leads to polar molecules. Um, how about chloroethane? I wouldn't expect you to know that. It's not ethane. Polar. Chloromethane. Polar. There's no lone pairs, but one of those atoms has a different electronegativity than the others. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So this forms a tetrahedral shape, which is symmetrical. It's a little hard for us to grasp that, but it is symmetrical in three dimensions. But one of those is pulling harder than the others, and so there's a net movement if you're playing tug-of-war in three dimensions, which is kind of hard to do. I guess you could do it underwater, perhaps. I don't know. But so this one is going to be polar. Okay? You see how that works? Both of those conditions have to be true. Now, is this always going to give you the right answer? No. Is it most of the time going to give you the right answer? Yes. And I won't give you one of those exceptions on an exam. These rules will work on my exam. Okay? No lone pairs in the central atom. All the atoms the same. It's nonpolar. If one of the atoms is different, if there are lone pairs, then we're going to predict that it's a polar molecule. Can you give another example for nonpolar? Yeah. Um... Let's do this. Go to another screen. What if we had um, boron trihydride? Now that one violates the octet rule, but that is the correct Lewis structure. Well, are there lone pairs on the boron? No. Are all the atoms the same? Yes. So this one's nonpolar. Well, we mentioned that boron tends to violate the octet rule. And I also mentioned that we're not going to, um, you know, I'm not going to try to trick you with violations to the octet rule. I told you about them because they're going to crop up occasionally in our examples and stuff, and I don't want you to freak out and, or just like, what on earth? That doesn't follow the octet rule. I thought she said the octet rule was everything. 
Well, yeah, the octet rule's awesome, but it doesn't always work. But if I ask you to write a Lewis structure on an exam or pick the correct one, I will not give you one that violates the octet rule. We save that for Chem 1. So if you're going to take Chem 1, you can look forward to that. Any questions about this? So let's, I don't want to make you dizzy, but let's go back to that example that we couldn't do because I put it in the wrong place. Which one of these molecules has one or more polar covalent bonds, but the molecule is nonpolar? Well, we kind of have to, to look at these. Well, carbon and oxygen, that's a diatomic molecule, right? Do you think carbon and oxygen have different electronegativities? They're not the same, so probably, right? So that one's going to be polar. So this is asking us which of these is nonpolar. So that one's polar. How about N2? That's a nonpolar molecule, but the question says, which one contains one or more polar covalent bonds, but the molecule is nonpolar? Does this fit that description? No, because it only has one bond, and that's a nonpolar bond. So that doesn't fit the description. Oxy um, oxygen, water. What do you lone pairs? There's lone pairs in the central atom, so this molecule is polar. Very good. So the bonds are polar, but the molecule is polar also. That doesn't fit the description. How about HF? That's a polar molecule with a polar bond. Well, hopefully SiO2. Let's look at SiO2. So we're going to have bonds here. Silicon has four valence electrons. So we got four, and each oxygen has six. So six and six is 12. So we've got 16 electrons we have to mess around with here. Um, so we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay, ran out of electrons. Hmm, okay, so we'll take this one and move it over here. That's not what I wanted to do. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Is everybody happy? No. The oxygen, no. The oxygen on the left is not happy. So let's take these electrons and stick them over there. Now that, that one's happy, but now the one on the other side isn't happy. So we're going to have to share some more because we don't have enough. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Correct number of electrons. And each of these atoms has an octet. Now that we have the Lewis structure, is this polar or nonpolar? Molecule. Nonpolar molecule. Nonpolar molecule. No lone pairs. And both of the atoms bonded to the central atom are the same. Does it have polar bonds? Yes. Yes, it does. Silicon and oxygen are different nonmetals, and so we would predict that they're polar. Okay, so that's... Oxygen the correct really answer. So yeah, oxygen's more electronegative, and so it's going to pull out, but they're pulling in opposite directions equally, and so it cancels out, and there's no net difference. There's no net dipole moment. And even if the middle was more negative, they'd still cancel out, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, regardless of which method you use, the vector addition or Mrs. K's rules of thumb, um, you still have to consider the shape of the molecule. If you were going to do vector addition in looking at this guy right here, you'd have to know that that's a linear molecule. The only way you can figure out it's a linear molecule is by drawing the Lewis structure and applying Vesper theory. Valence shell, electron pair repulsion theory. It's linear, okay? So the vectors are pointing out, they're opposing each other equally, net dipole moment of zero. Get back to where we were. So, why don't oil and water mix? Well, water molecules are polar. We looked at that already. 
Um, oil molecules, we didn't look at, but I'm going to tell you, oil molecules are nonpolar. So polar molecules have positive ends and negative ends, so they have these like mini ionic interactions of attraction between the positive end of one molecule and the negative end of the other, and those are really strong attractions. So the water wants to stay together. And then here's the oil trying to mix in, but it, it can't interact with the water in the same way that the water molecules interact with each other. And so the oil is actually just kind of excluded. It's pushed out of the water because of this um, attraction that the water has for it, the other water molecules. It's a little bit like having two groups of people. I'm, I'm Swedish and my husband's Japanese, so I'm going to pick on Swedes and Japanese. My, my children are half samurai and half Viking. They're, they're very vigorous, vigorous, strong children. Anyway, say you had two groups of people. You had one group of people that only spoke Japanese and another group of people that only spoke Swedish. And you had this big you know, party and you had these Japanese people and these Swedish people. Would there be a lot of mingling and small talk and interaction between them? No. The Swedes would probably talk with other Swedes and the Japanese would talk with other Japanese people, right? Because they, they can't interact with each other. Polar and nonpolar molecules don't speak the same language of interaction. They can't interact with each other, and so they don't. And so things like alcohol mix with water very nicely because alcohol is a polar molecule, and water's polar, and so they understand each other. And oil mixes with other oils because they're nonpolar, and they have, they have a similar way of interacting. Does that make sense? So that's why oil and water don't mix. Oh, what's this slide about? Oh, I like, I like this one with the marbles. It's coming back to me now. Okay, so this picture, these solid colored marbles are magnetic marbles, and the glass ones are not magnetic. So the magnetic marbles stick to each other, right? And they're going to stick to each other, and they're going to squeeze out the ordinary glass molecule, uh, molecules, <laughs> glass marbles because those glass marbles don't share that interaction that the magnetic marbles have with each other. So here, the glass marbles are like the oil, and the magnetic marbles are like the water. They're just sticking real tight together. It's like when you try to break into this clique of, of mean girls, right? In high school, the mean girls, you know, and they're talking to each other, and they won't let you in, right? Because they're just this group, and you can't get into it. That's what water's like. So even if you drop the glass marble into there, it would like push it out. Like if you dropped an oil drop into water. It right, it gets it's pushed out. Because yeah, you could you could separate all those magnetic marbles and, and try to mix them up, but there's that attraction and they're gonna go they're gonna squeeze together and pop the glass marbles out. This is an illustration of two water molecules. Um, so we have the oxygen is going to be the negative end, and the hydrogen end is going to be slightly positive. And so this hydrogen end of one water molecule is attracted electrostatically to the oxygen of another, just like, can't, oh, there we go. Can't see what I'm pointing at on my, my iPad. Just like the north and south, south poles of a magnet are attracted mm -hmm. to each other. And so then this is an illustration of what happens. Here's the oil. It's nonpolar and it just gets excluded from the water. Now, can you make them mix by adding something to them? Yeah. You can add an emulsifier or, or something like soap, and that sort of acts as a translator and allows them to communicate and allows them to interact. But without some sort of an intermediary that allows them to communicate with each other, they're not going to mix. Oh, so there's soap. It's a really, really crowded up, messy slide. So here's a picture of soap. Soap's cool. Soap has one end that's polar and then this long tail that's nonpolar. And so what soap does is the nonpolar end goes over and interacts with the greasy stuff, and the polar end interacts with the water. I think 
No, there's no, there's no picture. There should be a picture. I'll make a picture. So here you've got your, your grease globule, and here you've got the tails of the soap molecules are going to dissolve and interact with the grease. And then at the other end, I don't know why blue, but here you've got the, the polar end of the soap molecule. And those, it's kind of like circling the wagons. And you'll make these little things, they're called micelles. And, and then they make these little, they encase little pieces of the grease or the fat. And, but the outside is polar and can talk with the water, water. And so the water's like, oh yeah, come on in. But inside they're hiding the grease molecule. It's like, kind of like a Trojan horse sort of a deal. So chapter in review, chemical skills. Uh, we don't want to talk about that. You can look at that on your own. And so oh, look at those. I need to edit these slides. Look at all that. That's just lovely.